Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's very flattering to be on a lineup with so many clever people. Um, and it's nice to be here in Brighton, in my hometown. Uh, of all the events and the talks and the things that I get involved in, there's not too many that I get to do right here in Brighton. Um, but you know what? To be honest with you, most of all, I'm just thankful that I don't have to be that guy. I don't have to be the guy that opened UX Brighton the day after Brexit. <laughs> We're still in. <laughs> We're still in. Um, and who knows, maybe next year someone will come back and say the same thing. Um, so as Danny said, my name is Martin. Um, during the day, I lead the uh, user experience team at Virgin Atlantic. Um, but I'm not going to talk about planes today. Um, instead, uh, I wanted to kick us off with a little bit of, of retrospect before we get too far into the... Uh, inevitable introspect that comes along with events like this. So um, when Danny invited me to talk uh, today and he said that he was putting together an event around the craft of design and, and sort of further in the discipline itself, um, I, it's fair to say that I was a little bit hesitant. I don't um, push a lot of pixels these days. Um, my work is now sort of more focused on sort of setting up and running teams, so I, I don't get through an awful lot of post-it notes anymore. Um, and I started to question what I could really bring to today's proceeding that would be of interest or of value to you. Uh, and so I was scratching my head for a little bit. Uh, and then I found this quote uh, by Mr. Steve Jobs. He's somebody that you might have heard of. Um, and I, when I saw this, a lot of things fell into place for me, um, not just for this talk, but generally for kind of this point that I'm at in my career. Lots of the things that I see us doing and lots of the things that I see happening within our industry, um, whilst I recognize that they're kind of good steps forward and that they're progression for us all as a, as a community, I think there's a lot of reflection in things that have happened before us. Um, and I think there's a lot that we can learn actually by looking backwards. Um, and although that might seem retrogressive, I think that that's one of the most sort of key things to understanding where we're going. Um, before I kind of get into it too much, I just wanted to set a kind of general context here. So uh, when you think about it, when you look at it in the kind of grander scale of things, user experience design, um, it hasn't been around that long. It's actually quite new. So when you think about, um, you know, you go all the way back to kind of 1830 or so, the printing press has now become popularized. People are starting to consider the difference between how one thing is typeset, what sort of book covers are on there, and notice how that influences the way people are absorbing information. And it's kind of the, it's the first sort of references that I could find, at least, to the act of, or the uh, craft of design as a thing itself. And then you could sort of hit around 1858. I think this is roughly when Danny was born. This was kind of just after this. It's a, it's a bit me. It's an old man's laugh. Um, so this is after the Industrial Revolution. This is when people started to take more care over the things that are now being manufactured through to the 1950s, so on and so forth. So, you know, it's not until around 2003 that we actually started to see the terms user experience um, come together, and that's kind of when the term started to turn into a role itself. And so, you know, we're still very, very young. Um, and, you know, that's reflected still in today's businesses. Lots of organizations don't even know where to put their user experience teams. Um, how many people here are working in a user experience team that's inside marketing? Yeah, it's rubbish, right? How many people are still doing it? How many people are inside technology? Oh, what are we doing there? I worked in an organization where it was inside operations. That wasn't fun times. We were in the same department as the call centers. But I think this is all, you know, this is all just symptoms of, of how young we are, not just in our own community, but in the wider picture. Um, and like most adolescents, we're still kind of going through these identity crises. <laughs> I love this tweet. I just bring this out every chance I can. Um, you know, we're still arguing about what we should be calling ourselves, whether or not we're user experience designers, are we service design, interaction, product designers. You know, these are all kind of hallmarks of, of the stage that we're at. Um, 
And that's okay, you know, that's okay because we're growing and we're developing. But I think that we should not fall into the trap of thinking the things we're doing are entirely brand new. Many of the ideas that we're exploring today, you know, they come from other design disciplines. Lots of the problems that we as a collective group are trying to figure out have been tackled before by other designers. We're not the first discipline to walk along these paths. Many of the things that we're discovering now in amongst us have been discovered before. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to, uh, you always got to get Batman in there somewhere. I don't want to undermine any of the good things that are happening. Uh, you know, I'm not pointing at these things as a, as a way to deride the things that we're doing in the community uh, of design, of UX design, because I think they're very, very important. I just don't want us to fall into the trap of thinking that they're new. And I think that a lot of, uh, a lot of the things that we could uh, look at today as, as trends and topics within the industry um, can be connected, as Danny said, they can be connected back to things that have happened before. Um, so that was a lot of grand sweeping statements. So what I'm going to do is I was just going to go through these four topics here, these four things which I think are, I, know, I guess these could be described as, as trends or interest points within our industry. They're certainly getting a lot of airtime at the moment. Um, I was going to go through each one of these, um, take a look at how it connects to things that have happened before in the past, and maybe take a look at how those things in the past have developed so that we can, as a group, understand where our industry is going. Maybe you'll find it useful for your own careers. Maybe you'll just enjoy the old pictures. Maybe you won't. It doesn't matter. I'm the first speaker, so you'll forget most of this. So design ops. This is just my definition. This is nothing official. I'm just putting this up here to make sure that we're all on the same page, right? So design ops is a, you know, is a hot topic at the moment. There's a lot of people talking about it. It is, it is from my understanding, purely the recognition that as... Um, digital uh, maturity and design maturity starts to grow within organizations. We start to recognize the need to be able to gracefully scale our design practices. Uh, and so we need to dedicate time and resource and discipline to the running of the design practice, uh, not necessarily around the execution of design. Um, so you see lots of companies like Pinterest, you know, who are very advanced in this area. They've set up entire departments for design ops. Uh, you know, Airbnb have always been at the forefront of this area, uh, so much so that they've started open sourcing their tools now. Um, it's a hot topic, but people have been here before. This photo is uh, Unimark, legendary branding agency. Uh, I think this was taken in New York, it's 1966. Um, for those of you up on your design history, the guy with his arms folded in the kind of black suit right there, that's Massimo Vignelli. Uh, he went on to then brand... American Airlines, he created the design system for New York Subway, incredible designer. Um, I love this photo. There's so many good things going on in this photo. I like the stern looks on their face. This was a photo they took to attract clients, bear in mind, right? <laughs> the kind of disdain that stands between them and their work. I love the fact that they wore lab coats. They all put on white coats to seem more authoritative when they spoke to people. So good. I wish I was in that photo. Um, I want to draw your attention to the guy over on the right-hand side. That's Robert Moldovsky. He was a studio manager for Unimark. His job was to set up and to do the practical running of each of their design studios. They set up a number of studios around the world. Um, so he was not a designer. He was not outputting design. He was responsible for the running of the studio. So he took care of their... Um, their libraries, uh, he took care of their contracts, he took care of their processes, he was responsible for their tools. I, I don't really know what design tools were in the 1960s, probably rulers and pens and stuff, I don't know. Um, but, it, but he was doing design ops at that time, right? So much of what was set out at Unimark, what, a lot of the stuff that they did became a template for how design studios now are, are set up and run. Um, and so they established this practice of a studio manager, and he did kind of lots of kind of work in this area, um, as, as well as lots of other things that they did um, that, uh, that are still used today. Um, and so the, 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 the role of a design manager became firmly established in amongst branding agencies, um, even of small scales. You see people where there's two or three designers, and then there's one person who's responsible for running the studio. You know, they're effectively there for doing the recording and archiving and creating um, libraries of work, et cetera, et cetera. 
And lots of the stuff that they were doing in the past and lots of the stuff that they've done in brand agencies in the past, um, it's very, very similar. I mean, yeah, there are some fundamental differences there now that we're working with slightly different tools and slightly different mediums, but the practice is still the same. Um, and so over the years, the, the, the studio manager role then developed into what was described as design management. Um, and then through the sort of, I guess, sort of late 80s and into the 90s, you could then get qualifications in design management. It became enough of a thing that you could go to a college and school. And there's actually still, I found one place in the UK that's actually still doing a qualification in design management. And as we see these kinds of, these kind of different um, paths moving between the execution, the creative thought within the design process, and then the practical running of it, um, that qualification then led on to studio managers. Lots of studio managers then went into operational roles and they went into managing directors. And so the path from studio manager, or in our case design ops, into general management started to form. So lots of the studio managers from those times, they went on to become managing directors of studios, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see this pathway starting to appear within our world as well. Um, you take an example of somebody like Julie Zhu, who, who led the uh, product design practice at Facebook. Um, she recently published her first book. It's not a product design book. It's not about user experience. It's about management. It's about running teams. It's about management of people. Uh, Cap Watkins, he's another good example. He led the um, product design practice at Etsy. He since left there and went into management consultants. So you can see these kinds of threads starting to reflect. Um, so if design ops or research ops or whatever kind of ops side of things that you're into is a, you know, something that's of interest or taking up a lot of your time, you might want to consider that kind of pathway into general management. UX research. It's the U in UX, right? It's about us getting to walk in the shoes of our users. It's about us getting to know what's driving their behaviors. Um, it's pretty well known in our field. You know, Danny, as you said, he ran the kind of conference last year that kind of got into the details of it. A lot of us tend to fall into the trap of thinking this is what makes our discipline different from other design disciplines. This is David Ogilvy. I don't know how many people here have heard of David Ogilvy. This guy is just an absolute titan in the advertising world. He did things that were just phenomenal through his age and completely changed the face of marketing as we see it today. Um, and he's particularly in his worlds of, of test and learn campaigns and direct response marketing. He started his agency in 1949. 1952, according to his book, um, Ogilvy on Advertising, he built his um, in-house research department. Um, he was the, uh, the first that we can see uh, uh, of the advertising kind of madmen era to, to hire full-time researchers into their agency. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. They were one of the first agencies to hire full-time researchers, and they were there purely to... to observe the way people thought and felt, not just about the ad campaigns that they were, or marketing campaigns that they were producing, um, but also about the products themselves. And from that, Ogilvy and his team were able to go on and make very, very profound statements and kind of really reach out to people. Um, at the time, they kind of referred to them as motivational scientists, and it's something that Ogilvy took very, very seriously. Um, he was quoted in, in one of his books as saying, Advertising people who ignore the research, uh, ignore research are as dangerous as generals who ignore the decoded messages of their enemies, which is just a, a fantastic, so embattled that quote, I really like that. Um, and at the time, this kind of research, it, it focused much more on um, sort of declared preferences rather than observed preferences. It was a lot of focus groups, it was a lot of interviews, it was a lot of sort of door-to-door -door surveying. So the actual mechanics of the research was different to what we have available to us today. But it's, it was very much focused on what motivates people um, and then feeding that into their creative decision. Um, and so that, like I said, that became a standard practice and then over time that then developed into creative strategists. Now you walk into any ad agency today who's worth their salt, and there's a, there is the creative department, there's the strategy department, uh, amongst others. And so anyone who's kind of putting out a campaign these days, be it above the line campaign, below the line, through the line, around the line, whatever they want to call it, um, they're, all, they're all done with the uh, creative strategist in the room there, giving them insights and telling them where to place it within the market. 
Um, so if you can see, again, I'm just sort of making these connections between these things here. So if re UX research and that kind of side of the design discipline is something that's of interest to you, then you might want to consider, or we collectively might want to consider how that can then develop into um, the notion of strategists. But actually, you just describe yourself as a UX strategist. You? Danny, you're the, you're the pioneer in this area. Well done. Uh, UX writing. Um, so that, this is something which I think is very, very important and doesn't get talked about enough, but is now sort of starting to get some recognition out in our industry, right? Um, UX writing is uh, kind of the recognition that we're all creating interfaces that deliver information. Uh, and if we don't have people who are dedicated to taking care of that information, providing and understanding it, then we are doing practically half of our jobs in that respect. So, and I just want to sort of put this into a little bit of context. Put your hands up if you consider yourself to be a designer. That's a lot of you, right? Put your hand up if you consider yourself to be responsible for the interface. Put your hand up if you consider yourself to be a writer. It's three, two, four. That's, I mean, look around that room. That's a fuck of a lot of Laura Mipsum that we're dealing with there, right? That's, <laughs> that's not good. Um, and so lots of organizations, they're starting to get this, right? Companies like Deliveroo, companies like Intercom, uh, even the Gov UK teams, they are making content designers, UX writers a staple within their teams. We've introduced UX writing at um, Virgin Atlantic and it's been phenomenal for us. Um, and we are considering this to be a new way of working, but again, I would suggest that it's not. It's Bill Birnbach, looking like he's in a catalog here, from 1949. Uh, Bill Birnbach um, set up an agency, uh, and he was, the, he was the kind of guy who pioneered um, the removal of the line between design and copy. And he went on to change the way that marketing teams and, and, and branding teams are kind of set up today. What he did is, uh, I guess what the standard model used to be was that you would get a copywriter, and they would write these kind of big reams of text um, that were essentially adverts, and the client would like, make lots of changes, and they would sort of go back and forth, and once everybody was happy with the content, they would throw it into the art department and shut the door, and that person in there um, would do the illustration or work out the photography, and then that's how adverts were made. Um, and today, it's kind of, it's not dissimilar for us, except it's the other way around. You know, we're creating all these interfaces and interactions worry about the content later, and off it goes. And Bill Birnbach was the guy who just tore that down and said, actually, no, these, are, these, these two things have to be interconnected with one another. They have to be conjoined. Um, and so what he did is he formed uh, creative pairings, and, and then within his agency, within the campaigns, and working with the clients that you had at the time, like Volkswagen, they just went on to do some absolutely phenomenal, iconic work, particularly around, around that Volkswagen. Um, and he was famously the guy that sold a German car to Americans after the war. Um, and, over, and again, that kind of stuck as a standard practice, and that's kind of how ad agencies ran for a really long time. And then over, over the decades, that kind of steadily developed into creative teams. Uh, and so these are now interconnected teams, and you have an art director, and you have a copywriter on all your ad campaigns. But the line between them has become very, very blurry, and so as a kind of standard route through advertising, all the art directors are taught how to, to handle language and write uh, all the copywriters are, are taught how to kind of put together layouts and semiotics and understand how the visuals come together. Um, and it bears lots of resemblance in, in our products teams, right? It, it bears lots of resemblance to this concept that we have at the moment, which we like to kind of feel is a new concept of having multidisciplinary product teams clustering around a problem or a, or a product area or a KPI or whatever. Um, but it's that, it's that interconnectivity between the, inf bless you, the information that you're providing uh, and the way it's provided. So it just goes to show that um, that, that kind of combination has been there before, and that kind of blurring of lines between what we describe as, as being designers and those few unfortunate people over here who consider themselves to be writers, that needs to be much more interconnected if we're going to be able to produce something of, of real value. And then lastly, um, 
design systems. Got, got to have a design system, right? I mean, we were only 10 minutes into the event and someone's got to say design systems. You can't, I mean, you just can't open Twitter or Medium these days without somebody launching um, uh, their design system and talking about how they came to so came up with this fantastic name and all these pattern libraries, et cetera, et cetera. It's, you know, it's a, it's a hot topic at the moment, and there's lots of discussion about are they good, are they bad, do they stifle creativity, do they, do they help us, are they more efficient, blah, blah, blah. We're figuring all this stuff out as a group. This is just our way of kind of learning and understanding how we can scale with them. This is, uh, this is the work of Gerald Barney, 1965. He designed the, um, the British Rail, what was called at the time, Identity Manual. Um, if you ever get your chance to get your hands on this thing, it's a fantastic document. It really is like a big, fat kind of binder thing with lots of information, and it's very, very beautiful. But it's nothing, this isn't a brand um, manual. There's nothing about tone of voice or marketing position in here. What they created was um, a series of mechanics, a series of components that could be pulled apart and put together following a set of rules so that you could create internal systems, internal kind of uh, documentation, manuals, et cetera, et cetera, or external communications like wayfinding, pamphlets, or whatever it is they used to create at the time before the British rail system was decimated. Um, so it's, it, yeah, it's, it, it, is, it is a very, very beautiful piece of work, and it is, in fact, a kind of start of a form of a design system. Back then, it, they didn't really kind of call it that. They called it an identity Manual and so identity manuals um, through the 80s and 90s, when when the term branding or, or the, the 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 notion of brand design started to become a thing, everyone created brand manuals, right? You, you know, most people who are working in marketing today, or lots of people who are working in design, know the way around a, a, a brand document. You know, it's certainly become a staple within our design disciplines. Um, but it's developed over time, you know, it's developed from those points when people used to big, print out massive great big documents and then revise them and print them again. Um, and then they turned into PDF documents. Um, and, you know, everybody knows now that PDFs are just where good ideas go to die. And so eventually, eventually brand uh, agencies started to evolve that towards brand platforms. And so what we've seen now is a movement away from these very, very restrictive sets of rules and do's and don'ts, and much more towards um, creating a platform from which other people can go and take the things that you've started and the keystones that you've put out and started to develop with them. And so brands have started to move towards these ideas of just being the providers of the guidelines and letting everything else develop on top of those, and that's how you kind of strengthen your design system. AOL, one of the first people to uh, kind of really get into this. I don't even know if they exist anymore, but it doesn't matter. Um, you have someone like Apple, for example. You know, they're kind of all often heralded as being kind of very good at branding and having a well-controlled brand. Look at every one of their um, event invites, and all you get is just this kind of play upon a logo, and it can be 3D, colorful, whatever. Sky have been doing this for a while. Um, I'm not terribly in love with their brand, but you know, I think it's very clever the way they have a couple of kind of set elements to it, and then everything else just flexes and changes depending upon the, the context and the need of that kind of in, that thing. And I think that's something which we can start to kind of reconsider the way that we're putting together design systems. You see lots of arguments and lots of kind of worries and concerns about the design systems that we're building today restricting creativity. Brand teams have solved this problem. Right? This is this is. This is something which we could be moving through much more quickly than this. So as I start to wrap up, <clears throat> what I'm doing here is just very simply drawing these lines between the things that are happening today and the things that are happening in the past. Um, I think that there's an awful lot that we can take by just looking backwards for a minute and looking into other design disciplines that are much more established than ours. Um, so that we, so that you, as the designers, um, the people who are responsible for creating interfaces can move forwards, and move forwards with the comfort that, um, and, and the safety and the knowledge that others have been here before. Um, outside of the few that I've talked about today, there's lots of other examples of this happening. I just, I just picked those ones because they happen to be around and there's good examples sitting around. There's lots more that you can kind of go and find out there yourself. I think particularly this, this notion of 
ethical design, which I'll be perfectly honest with you, I, I don't understand because it kind of infers that there's design without ethics, which then makes me very sad. But you know, architecture has solved this a long time ago. The way that architecture has woven sustainability, the use of materials, the use of their structures into their practice as standard, these are all things that I think we should be paying very close attention to. And it's not that we're in this position because anyone's done anything wrong or that the industry is in a bad state. You know, it's just the, it's just the we have to recognize it's just that we're still growing and we're still learning where we sit in the world. Um, so here's a few kind of book recommendations that you can take away. These are all things that I've read and that I've thought were very interesting. There's tons of blog posts out there about this kind of stuff that you can look at. If this, is, this kind of stuff isn't of any interest in you, go sit in front of Netflix and just mainline a couple of seasons of Mad Men and you'll see what I'm talking about. There's a ton of stuff out there. So I'll leave you with this because um, it's always good to get a McLuhan quote in there. Um, Marshall McLuhan was a writer and philosopher who predicted with um, an eerie level of accuracy the kind of lots of cultural and, and technology developments over the years. And he said that we look at the present through a rear view mirror and we march backwards into our future. Thank you very much. <laughs>